Hey, I'm here with Travis Wright, Principal Group Program Manager in the Azure Data Organization. And we are going to talk about how you can treat your databases in a hybrid environment, just like cattle. Yeah, awesome. What does that even mean, treating your databases like cattle? Well, let's get into it. You know, if you've heard of this phrase before of pets and cattle, you know what I'm talking about. And we'll kind of get into what I mean by that. But really what we want to talk about today is how ARC-enabled data services allow you to run your databases in a highly available way on any infrastructure. So let's dive in and talk about this. Well, what do you mean by this databases or cattle too? Well, one thing I want to just kind of bring up here is kind of the origin of this from Randy Bias. He was, you know, it says here, struggling with explaining to customers how cloud native apps and cloud more generally was fundamentally different than what they had been doing before. And it's kind of ironic but fitting that he was um, watching this presentation about scaling SQL Server that gave him this idea to think about the difference between how we used to do things before, which is kind of how we treat our applications and including databases like pets are very important to us, uh, instead of like cattle, like we try to treat things here going forward. So. Let's kind of talk about this, right? So here's a couple of pictures of my pets. I just got this cat. Her name's Mishka. She's super cute, a little kitty, uh, super yeah. awesome. Um, we love her to death. We've got our dog, Teak. This is a picture of him when he's a puppy. We love our pets. You know, we, we, they're, they're unique to us. We love them. We care for them. They're super important to us. Uh, now, cattle, you know, they serve a purpose, but, you know, we don't really typically name our cows, although... You know, when I was growing up, I went to visit my grandma on her ranch and she had a, a calf there and I named, I don't remember what I named it. So that shows you how important it was to me, right? Even that little calf in my experience as a young child, I don't remember, yeah. right? That's just, cows just aren't important, right? So, yeah. Well, um, for some people they are, right? But I, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I get your point there. And I think I, it's funny, like when you, when you came up with this session and we talked about it, I was like, wow, this is like, I heard similar things about servers, right? I mean, we had the same thing when we talked about like just managing server servers and operating systems. And I was like, huh, you can do that for databases too. And and so I really yeah. find it like a uh, interesting, interesting topic to see like, okay, we should probably do that for databases. Yeah, <laughs> people think of databases as more like pets. You really care about them because they're so critical. You know, the data is just so important and becoming more important over time. And uh, so we, I think we kind of tend to think of them more like pets, but I think as we go forward and we evolve, like we need to think about them more like cattle in the sense that we need to make them like really resilient and available and and any one little database instance shouldn't really matter, right? And so that's what we'll get into today is how we can kind of evolve forward and treat our databases like cattle, right? And I'll, I'll yeah. get into kind of what I mean by that. So this is actually interesting. I Sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt you here, but so this is like something we want to do not just like just because we are obviously a hybrid session this is not something we want to just do in the cloud just to be clear you're talking about this also doing that on premises or in a hybrid environment or in a multi-cloud environment just to just to make yeah, sure exactly you know people don't really think about it that much but for microsoft and other big cloud providers when we offer a database as a service solution we manage millions and millions of database instances and in that sense, we as Microsoft, you know, we, we don't care about any one database instance, as you'll see here in a minute. It's, it's not important, that one database instance. I'm sure it's a client thinks that it's important, but as you see here in a minute, we actually have a way to make sure that we treat our databases like cattle, yet from our customer's point of view, that database instance is always there. They can always use it. They can love it and care for it however they want. But from our point of view, managing those millions of databases just another database, right? And we'll get into kind of what we mean by that. Awesome. And, and kind of what we want to do is we want to take the learning of how we've been able to efficiently operate these millions and millions of database instances with, you know, four nines plus of availability in the cloud with just a handful of people back in building 43 in Redmond managing the whole thing. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's really, we just have a less than 10 people on call at any point in time trying to take care of those millions of database instances. So how can we take that scale and efficiency and deliver that to customers to realize those same benefits on any infrastructure, including their own data center or even other public clouds. Yeah. Okay, so let's kind of dive in here. You know, 
if you think about applications, right? Typically applications are set up in a way where you can have many instances of the application. They're stateless. They sit behind a load balancer. Your application clients connect to that load balancer. The connections get routed to any one of these different instances of the application. And those, any one of those application instances could go down. The connections will be re rerouted to the remaining applications and, and you're fine, right? And you can also scale them out and things like that. And so in that sense, they're kind of like cattle, right? Mm -hmm. um, but your database is singular. That's kind of how we think about it is there's just one database. And so we think of that as being more like a pet and we have to make sure that it's okay, right? So let's kind of think about how we can evolve this thinking. And if we think about how um, cattle workloads can be characterized, right? They, they have certain attributes. You can sort of think about it that each cow <laughs> is a duplicate of the others, right? Every cow is the same. Um, cows can be quickly added to the herd and they can perform the same function as the other cows. They're not unique, they're not special in that sense. And you don't really care whether a cow dies or not, right? Because they aren't special. Now, to be clear, we didn't hurt any cows in the presentation here, um, but we don't really care so much if just one cow dies, we, we have others. Um, and the more cows you have, the more capacity you have, right? So if, if you think about milk cows, for example, if you have you know, 10 cows, that's more than five cows and you get th double the amount of milk, right? So uh, in that sense, as we scale our cattle workloads, we can have more capacity as we add more cows. So let's think about how that might look in the sense of um, databases. So um, one of the things that we've done historically over time is we've separated out the storage from the compute so that even if the compute goes down for some reason, we can just bring back a new instance of the compute mounted to the storage and keep going and we didn't really lose the data and that's that's okay. And in this sense, I kind of feel like these are databases that are cow wannabes, right? They want to be a cow, but they're not really a cow because, um, you know, yeah, the storage is duplicated, but the compute isn't, right? And so we're reliant on that one instance of the compute to be available in order to actually access the data in the storage. Um, you can't quickly add additional database instances in this way and you don't have, um, additional capacity that you can scale out in this pattern. You just have the one database instance for compute. And once you max out that compute, you're done, that you can't scale beyond that. And if that one compute instance dies, then we lose access to the data. So that's not really a true cow. This is a cow wannabe pattern, right? It's okay, it's better than a, than a true pet in that sense, yeah. but it's not quite all the way there yet, right? Yeah. So when we think about how we want to treat our databases like cows, this is where here at Microsoft in SQL Server back uh, a few releases ago, we added some technology called always on availability groups. And what that does is it has a very similar pattern to how people do application cow patterns, right? It's you have multiple database instances. Each of them has a copy of the data and you have those database instances back behind a load balancer and a router, just similar to how you would have your application clients connect to your applications. And so in this pattern, it is, more like a, a cow pattern, right? You have a, a database, each database is a duplicate of the other. You get a full synchronous copy of the data across multiple instances. You can add additional database instances quickly and they will get seeded and populated with the same copy of the data so that they have that data and they perform exactly the same function as the other database instances. And you don't care if any one database instance dies, we can promote another one of the remaining database instances quickly to become the new primary and you can just keep going. And the more database instances you have, the more you can scale out your capacity. As you see here in this diagram, we could have some applications that connect with a read-only intent, and we can balance those read-only connections across n number of database instances. It could be even more than two. And so we can actually increase our capacity by adding these additional database instances here. Okay, so so this is actually this is actually interesting because this is how how as a customer. I obviously still think as it as like I kind of like as a pet, right? I see like so I still create my my uh, Azure SQL database there, and it's one database for me. Like it's one database, but in the background, actually, we are using that to actually like replicate these and create, as you said, these multiple instances. Um, do I see that as a cu customer, or is, like I, is it for me just a checkbox, basically, um, where um, like okay, I just turn on this like the always on feature and yeah. So in our PaaS services in Azure, like Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL Managed Instance, 
Uh, this just happens by default behind the scenes. There's not even really an option. We just make it that way. And uh, this is really great in PaaS services because you don't really have to think about it. But behind the scenes, this is what enables us to do things like updating your database instances with no application downtime. Because we just pull one of these at a time out of the availability group, update it, and then put it back in. Right? So you always have multiple instances that are available. And this is also how we increase our resiliency and how we can offer four nines of financially guaranteed availability, right? And if one instance dies for whatever reason, hardware dies, database instance runtime dies, doesn't matter. We still have others that we can fail over into and keep going. Now, the question is, how do you get that same level of availability outside of our Azure PaaS services? And that's where Arc Enabled Data Services comes in, and we're going to talk about that today. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, it would be great if we could have the same thing <laughs> on premises yeah. or <laughs> somewhere else. Exactly. Like, if you if you think about how you can, because the always on availability group technology has been in SQL Server for a while, and lots of enterprise customers use it. But to set it up is kind of a pain, you know, like on the Windows side, you have to install Windows Server, then you have to configure cluster services, then you have to install SQL Server, then you have to create the always on availability group. And it's similar over on the Linux side, except that we use Pacemaker as the cluster manager. And it's just kind of a pain. And it's different for every VM fabric cloud and cluster manager you have. There's so many different combinations of how you do this. And so what we want to do is provide a better, more modern way of doing that. And that's kind of how, as we talked about here in Azure SQL, those services are highly available by design. When you provision a database instance, it's just there. It's just HA already, that kind of thing. But then what do you do if you, if you can't do this in Azure? If you need to have your database on premises or you need to be in another public cloud example, how can I do this in a way which is consistent with how we do it in Azure, but yet I can run it on any infrastructure, right? And that's, yeah. that's the idea. Yeah. So this is where we have our Arc Enabled Data Services offerings that are currently in public preview. There's two services, the Azure SQL Managed Instance Service, which we'll talk about today, and the Azure Database for PostgreSQL Hyperscale. The SQL Managed Instance Service is based on the SQL Server engine. So you can take any of your databases that you have running on SQL Server today and bring those over to run inside of an Azure SQL Managed Instance enabled by Azure Arc on your own infrastructure wherever you want and get those high availability benefits just and a high degree of application compatibility as you come over so that it's a pretty seamless migration. But when you do that, not only do you get this sort of automatically provisioned high availability, but you get an always current service. We're always automatically updating the binaries to give you the latest features and the latest updates, just like we do in our past services in Azure. You can elastically scale those instances up and down with no application downtime using the always on availability group technology, which we'll dive into today. And you get a unified management experience where it provides you backup and restore you get uh, built-in monitoring, you get built-in automatic updates, and then you can integrate with Azure services like Azure Policy, Azure Defender, Azure Backup, Azure Monitor, to be able to kind of at scale manage all of your database instances using Azure as your sort of aggregation point there. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. Again, again, I heard like from many, many customers are here for, exactly for these reasons. That's why they love Azure SQL, right? They just like say, hey, look, I want to like, basically all my databases should probably run on Azure SQL. However, we have reasons why we can't run it on Azure. Like for example, yeah. I think we have data sovereignty challenges. We have especially also like uh, connectivity challenges where like latency is just too high for the application to work. Or, for example, like they have no connectivity at all. And I see on your slide here, it also says, like, even though they get disconnected support. So, even if I, uh, that would basically allow me to run Azure SQL on a place where I don't have connectivity to Azure. Like, is that, that true? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All these sort of benefits here, these PaaS like capabilities, you can run them in your own infrastructure, even without a direct connection to Azure. So really powerful stuff. And it's really kind of, as I was talking about earlier, it's kind of taking all of the things that we've learned and all the technology we've built to operate things at the scale of millions of database instances and delivering that to customers so that they can realize those same benefits uh, on their own infrastructure. The way I like to think about it is, if you can't come to Azure, we'll bring Azure to you, right? Yeah. That's what we're doing here. Yeah. And Arc Enabled Data Service is just one of many Azure services which are being Arc Enabled, right? There, um, we have Arc Enabled Servers and Arc Enabled SQL Server, Arc Enabled Kubernetes that are already in preview and more on the way. Oh, this is awesome again. And I, I, I think I really highly, I think I appreciate the work here because as, as probably people like, 
think about this in Azure, when we have a service, we build it obviously for thousands of servers, right? Like literally like thousands of servers. However, I think for our customers, we probably need to scale that down a little bit. So it's not just like a one-to-one -one copy probably of just like how the backend works. It probably needs to have some changes and modifications and. <laughs> yes, yes. Make it uh, actually usable by somebody, right? Absolutely. So this, yeah, think of it this that way as a sort of like a, all the same capabilities, but in a way where people can, you know, realistically deploy and operate it in their own environment. And the, one of the key technologies that enables that is Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is really important in this strategy because it creates an abstraction layer over the underlying infrastructure and virtualization stacks. So that way, you know, whether a customer is using something like VMware on premises or they're using maybe uh, EKS on top of EC2 and AWS, it, it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't matter what your virtualization engine is, doesn't matter what your storage is, it doesn't matter where it is, right? As long as you have Kubernetes over the top of it all, we can consistently sort of program to the Kubernetes API and deploy and operate these Arc enabled data services on any infrastructure, right? So that way it's super consistent wherever you go. Yeah. Okay, that that is also important. Like I mean, I many customers probably have seen that sign they think, "Hey, do I need now some size, some like Microsoft version of Kubernetes to run that, or is it like right. something special? Because I run already right. Kubernetes. Probably they run that in their data center. They probably have like things like OpenShift or like other yeah. other Kubernetes flavors, and so they're going to be happy that they can just use uh, their existing infrastructure for that. Yeah, virtually every enterprise I'm talking to these days is at some point in their journey towards migrating to Kubernetes. You know, en masse. Everything I think will eventually be uh, on Kubernetes. And, and I think um, it, it's a sea change that's sort of on the scale that we saw with virtual machines back in the, the early 2000s. It's a completely different pattern for it that a lot of customers are starting to adopt. And yeah, that flexibility to use any Kubernetes is super key. You can use our AKS service, which is a managed path service in Azure. You can use AKS on Azure Stack HCI, or you can use AKS on Azure Stack Hub. Those are all great options, you know, sort of top to bottom, provided by and supported by Microsoft. But if you want to bring your own Kubernetes with OpenShift on premises, or you want to use a managed Kubernetes service like EKS in AWS or GKE in Google Cloud, that, that's fine too. You know, you got that flexibility. Awesome. All right, so let's kind of talk about um, a couple of different pricing tiers that we have for high availability in Azure SQL Managed Instance with Azure Arc. You can kind of think about standard HA as being sort of like the cow wannabe pattern that we saw earlier. You know, we separate out the compute and the storage, and if the storage, uh, the storage is sort of our persistent layer for keeping state, but then if the compute goes down, there's no problem, we can bring it back. And then we've got the premium high availability where we have the multiple instances and availability group, and that's more of the, the true cow pattern. Right. So let's look at a kind of a just a diagram and, and a sort of flow of how this actually works. So with standard high availability, you have our data controller here, which is kind of the brains of the operation running inside of your Kubernetes cluster. You have some number of Kubernetes nodes here. You have a SQL managed instance running here. And uh, you've got some load balancer that's routing the connections into here. And your storage is out here on some persistent volume. And this points to it could be a SAN, it could be in the case of a managed cloud service like Azure, it could be Azure Files. So you got flexibility about where this persistent volume goes, but from the point of view of the database here, it just is writing to the local file system, but Kubernetes is taking care of routing the actual file storage operations, the IO, out to this persistent volume. So in this case, if something were to happen to that pod or even the node on which this pod was run, Kubernetes will automatically reprovision another SQL instance to another node, or maybe even the same node if it was just a pod failure. And it'll remount to that persistent volume where the database files are out. And the database engine will just do the standard database recovery as if you know, the SQL server process had crashed on a Windows server, for example. And it'll just keep going, right? And in that sense, this whole process here, as we'll see here in a minute, takes about a minute or so, and you can get back up and running, no problem. All of your applications just simply need to reconnect to the load balancer and the load balancer will take care of routing the connection to the new pod that's been deployed. So I think about this as kind of like the, the cow wannabe pattern, right? We separated out compute and storage, but it's not a true sort of uh, cow pattern here. The yeah. true cow pattern comes in with the premium high availability. Here we have multiple nodes. We have multiple SQL instances, one of which is 
deployed as the primary, the others are the secondary. And this availability group here, this gets automatically provisioned for you at the time that you provision a, a SQL managed instance in Azure Arc. Everything is done. You just click a button and everything comes up just like in our past services. Now in this pattern, um, if you have an application that's read write, it connects into one load balancer and gets sent to the primary. If you have a read only application, it hits a different load balancer and it gets routed to the two secondaries, right? Now, in the event of a pod failure in this case, what happens is Kubernetes will orchestrate the, the nomination of a new primary and it'll tell that database instance, you're the new primary. It'll update the read write load balancer that it's now going to point to this primary pod. And this application re can reconnect and start talking to that primary. And this I is guess, just a failover operation. This is really yeah. quick. I guess that can then also happen super quickly. Like, uh, again, like probably, I don't know, we're speaking of seconds or? Uh, yeah, which... exactly. This, uh, we'll see the demo of it today. We just finished the first kind of build of this. So it's not quite down to the level of seconds yet. Um, but we'll see that, yeah, this will eventually over time as we finish tuning this, this will get down to, you know, a small number of seconds to be able to fail over and allow your read write applications to come back into here and reconnect. Nice. nice. Yes. Now, part of the challenge here, as we'll see here, and I'll, I'll explain here in a minute kind of what the challenges are in this space, because I, I want to get deep into the tech here pretty soon. Okay, so now um, what Kubernetes will also do is it'll help us reprovision another secondary. It'll update the read only load balancer to point to that one. This one will get reseeded so that it catches up to everything else and you're good to go, right? So that's kind of how the availability groups work on Kubernetes. Okay, now. <clears throat> Um, let's get into doing some demos. All right. Awesome. Enough slides. <laughs> I like demos. That sounds like, like, that's like a good idea. <laughs> that's what we're all here for really. Right. Okay. So I've got a couple of different environments here. Um, the first one is I've got a Kubernetes environment and, um, we're going to log into this environment and I'm going to just show you kind of, um, how things look in this environment. So first I'm going to monitor this uh, namespace here inside of my uh, environment here. So every five seconds or so, this is going to refresh. But what we see here is we've got this um, set of pods that are deployed as what I mentioned as the data controller earlier. So this is kind of the brains here that provides all the management, monitoring, backup, provisioning, all those kinds of the services are provided by this set of pods here. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do next, uh, is this I'm going to log in. Okay. So now that we're logged in using the AZ data command line utility, we can now start to provision a SQL instance. So I'm going to run this command here, AZ data arc SQL MI create. And all I have to do is just give it a name. That's it. I don't have to specify really anything else and off it goes. There are other options I can specify in terms of how many cores I want or memory I want or whatever. But if I just take all the defaults, all I have to provide is a name, one simple command. Here you can see that the SQL instance is now coming up. And this pod right here has the SQL container in it that's going to actually be the SQL engine. So. Now, when you go to deploy a highly available SQL instance, as we'll see here in a minute, like all you really have to do there is you just pass the tier parameter and you set it to the business critical tier. And then in that case, it will deploy an always on availability group pattern, which we'll see uh, next. Okay. So, but in this case, we're, de we're deploying the cow wannabe pattern. It's just a single SQL instance coming up here. You can see that we have now two out of the three pods ready to go. So let's dive in and kind of really take a look at the details of this pod. Um, so I'm going to run a command here called SQL MI show. And this is going to show us the details of this pod. Um, now you can see down here, for example, <clears throat> that this is currently in the arc namespace inside of my Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we're connecting to it through a load balancer. I've requested five gigs of storage for the data and the logs. And I've got these endpoints here for the log search and metrics dashboards. And then this is the endpoint that I connect to if I want to connect to this SQL instance from an application or from a database tool here like Azure Data Studio or SQL Server Management Studio. And you can see that right now it's in the creating state still, and we're sort of at this zero one state. Okay. Now, 
the other thing I want to kind of point out here is, is that automatically when we deployed this database instance, we told Kubernetes to deploy a service. And a service is really that kind of load balancer that we talked about earlier that will take care of routing incoming connections to the pod wherever it's located. So my applications will always just connect to this IP address and this port number here. And Kubernetes will take care of routing of that to the pod. And so even if it moves around from node to node, no problem. Kubernetes will make sure that the application connections get routed to the right place. OK, now let's also describe this pod. I want to just kind of show you um, inside of here, we've got a few different containers. Here's the Fluent Bit container. And uh, here's the SQL MI container. OK, so this is the SQL engine container running inside of there. And um, down here, we'll see that the var log is mounted to this persistent volume claim right here. And var opt, where the database files are at, is mounted to this persistent volume claim. And if we go down here now, we can see <clears throat> that these mounts right here are, are indicated. And so if we go look at um, this persistent volume claim here, all right, so just scroll down here so I can get back to my notebook. We're going to go look at this persistent volume claim in detail. So this is the persistent volume claim. And we can see this. So a persistent volume claim basically just allows a pod, or in this case, a container, to have a claim on an underlying persistent volume. And so this persistent volume is, is currently mounted to this um, persistent volume claim is mounted to this persistent volume here. So now we can go and we can actually look at the persistent volume. This one. You can see here that it's using the Azure disk as the underlying storage because I'm running this in AKS in Azure. Yeah. So this will, could also be like if I would run that like on prem, this could also be like, let's say, a remote file share or like whatever you're using as your persistent options in your Kubernetes cluster, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you're using something like a NetApp storage device or something, then you could use persistent volumes in, in NetApp yep. on premises. That's the beauty of Kubernetes is that there's all these different storage plugins that abstract which underlying storage you're using. All you really care about when you provision applications is that you specify your storage class, and Kubernetes takes care of the rest. It can yep. uh, set up all the PVs for you on whatever storage you choose. OK, so now the kind of interesting thing about this, so now we're looking at the persistent volume, and you can see that this is the disk URI, right? So if I go grab this particular disk name right here, and I go up into the Azure portal, <clears throat> we can see that disk right here. And we can see, for example, that this disk is a 5 gig custom disk, right? Just like we mm -hmm. saw earlier when I showed you the persistent volume in the pod configuration it is uh, configured to be a 5 gig storage, right? Yep. I can choose a bigger size if I want to or whatever. That's what currently what it is, right? OK, so that's kind of how the storage gets mapped through. Now we can see that the SQL instance is fully up and running now. We're at, uh, we got three out of three pods, which means that our SQL container is also up and running. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to just run this command here, which is a kubectl exec. And this uses a command to go inside of the container, if you will, and execute the command over here to the right of this double dash. So in this case, this is a Linux container. So I'm going to ls this directory here, which is where the database files are at inside of my container. So you can see here are some familiar files, master.mdf for the master database data file, for example, right? But that's really all we've got is kind of the standard system databases inside of here so far. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pull down the AdventureWorks database from GitHub. We're just doing essentially a wget here that will pull down that database file. And if we go back up here now and run this ls command here again, we'll see that the AdventureWorks database spec file has been downloaded to our data directory. So now that that database file is there, we can restore this just like we would um, any other. Sorry, this is kind of hard to navigate on this <laughs> giant size font here. But um, so we're going to change this here. Here. Okay, so now we're going to restore that database. Just standard restore command here. Um, yep. In this case, we're going to map it over to the data directory here. And uh, so now we're restored, right? So if I 
Um, clear this result. Go back up here and run this again. Uh, we can see that we have our AdventureWorks MDF and LDF log files now. All right. So now we can just connect to that and run standard queries. I'm just going to select um, from the person table, for example, here. Right. So I'm just going to run this query. And uh, there you go. So now what we've done is we've kind of shown how um, this is just SQL, right? It, it, yep. We can connect to it and do things with it just like we would normally. And we've made some changes to the disk now, right? So since we provisioned it, we've now downloaded the back file into that disk. We have restored the database. We've run a query against it. I could even insert data into the table and make those kinds of changes. That's all going off to that Azure disk. It's not inside of that pod, right? So now if I go and kill my pod, right? If I kill that wannabe cow, that pod is going to go away. You'll see it down here. It's going to go down. And it's, oh, it's already gone down. It's coming back up now. So you can see okay. the lifetime here is 10 seconds. So while this pod is coming up, this takes about a minute, right? Let's kind of ponder what's happening, right? The, the pod containing the SQL container and the two agents that are responsible for managing it was deleted, right? So that means that all three of those containers were gone, right? Yep. But Kubernetes is designed to be resilient. It's a desired state system. So it has a stateful set back behind this that is designed to um, keep this at a current state. And, and the state here in this case means that this pod should exist, right? And so Kubernetes will keep trying to make this pod happen even if it gets deleted for some reason. And so that's what's happening here behind the scenes is that Kubernetes is the one that's coming in here and kicking this off automatically to reprovision this pod to get it back to the desired state. Yeah, so that that's awesome. So that means like it's really like again, we just make sure that I still have it, even if someone would go in accidentally delete it or something would crash. I mean, potentially I would like also deploy that obviously in different physical machines at the end, like underlying fabric, to make sure that when one physical machine crashes, that this would have basically kind of like the same effect. And then Kubernetes would go and say, hey, okay, then I provision some new stuff here. Um, and that, and also that doesn't have an impact on the files, right? So the volume you showed earlier, mm -hmm. um, my guess is I could still just access that, these files and see the files there, um, which are on that volume. That's right. Just use an Azure disk, right? You could mount it to another VM and browse that file system if you wanted to, for example. Yep. Um, so in that sense, yeah, the files are not gone. They're still there, right? And so if I, if I go back up here, and I run this query again, you'll see that it'll just connect back to the database and run the same query we did before. Database is still there, the, that AdventureWorks database that we restored. We didn't lose it, right? Yep. So that's how the wannabe cow pattern works, right? Now, this is pretty good, right? I mean, it took about, what, 75 seconds to get yep. this database instance back up and running. Um, that's OK. That's maybe not as fast as we might like it, but it's pretty good. I, I think for many customers, they would already be happy Happy with, in some scenarios, they would be very happy if they can do that, right? I mean, that's that's already like uh, sufficient for, for many scenarios. I'm like, of course, there. I probably also want to see now the scenarios where this is not good enough. Right. So in those scenarios, you know, I think about where you try to get to the true cow pattern, where you can immediately fail over to a hot standby database instance that has a full copy of the data. So theoretically, we should be able to fail over faster, right? And also, this doesn't help us scale out. It's just one database instance. Mm -hmm. There's no read scale here like you get with a, a true cow pattern with the always on availability group, right? So we're not quite to cow here yet, but we're getting pretty close. <laughs> All right, so now let's go take a look at the sort of true cow pattern, if you will. We're going to set up this environment here. This is a different environment. And in the near future, when we put this out into the public preview, this is how you'll deploy a business critical SQL managed instance. Same thing as we saw before, except there's these additional parameters here where instead of the default general purpose tier, you choose the business critical pricing tier and you specify the number of read replicas that you want to have. And we'll take care of provision always on availability group for you. So that you really don't have to think about it like you do when you're trying to set it up in a Windows or, or a Linux pacemaker environment. It just automatically happens for you. OK, now when you do this, um, I've already got one set up because it takes a little while to deploy it. But let's let's kind of look what this looks like here. So same as we saw before, except you know, here's all the management pods and everything for the data controller. But now this one instance that we deployed SQL test, it has three pods. 
each of which has these four containers, one of which is the SQL engine container inside of this pod. So this is how we get to, to true Cal, right? Is we get multiple of these things going. Each of these has a full copy of the data and that's how we can manage things. Now, <clears throat> um, I wanna show you for you know SQL Server DBAs or experienced users, sorry, I'm on a 4K screen, so I can't scale this, but those of you that are familiar with this, you're familiar with the SQL Server Management Studio, always on availability group dashboard. Here we've got our uh, availability group. It's in a healthy state. We can see SQL test zero, one, and two. And uh, one of them, the top one here, SQL test one is the primary and it's set up for synchronous replication. And so, you know, for those of you that are familiar with always on availability groups and how you would manage those inside of, um, inside of SQL Management Studio, this is exactly the same, right? And right. in this case, I'm connected to a Azure SQL Managed Instance enabled by Azure Arc on Kubernetes, but the experience is the same. And that's important for those that are coming from a SQL Server background. We want to have them have a familiar user experience as they come into this new way of doing things. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and log into AZ Data. And this is gonna log me into the data controller. And now I'm gonna do the same show command that we saw previously. So we can get some details about this instance. Um, in this case, you'll notice that there's a little bit different thing here where it says that replicas is three, right? Because we specified we want three replicas. Um, here I'm using local storage. Now this is a really important thing to understand because <clears throat> with the wannabe cow pattern, you have to use remote storage because you only have one copy of the data. Right. And so in that sense, you don't want it to be on the same machine as your database engine, because if that entire machine goes offline, there's no way to recover. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, so does that mean like, of course, that would also be interesting to see then I could use very, very fast local storage. Right. Is exactly. that another benefit of that? Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because, you know, remote storage is, is pretty fast, but local storage is the fastest. Right. It'll give you the best performance. And so one of the really big benefits of using always on availability groups is you can create copies of the data. Each database instance on each physical machine has a full copy of the data. And so even if you lost an entire physical machine, it's not a problem because you have multiple copies of the data. Um, so this is really important. That's why this is kind of a feature that's available in the business critical pricing tier is because um, this really gives you a, an opportunity to have the maximum storage performance, which as we know for databases is super important. Okay, now um, what I want to do here is I want to bring up our metrics dashboard because this will help us keep an eye on what's going on. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and bring this up here. So the metrics dashboard, the way this works is we collect all of the monitoring metrics about a given database instance into an influx DB database. And then we chart things like transactions per second, batch requests per second, weight statistics, and so on over time so that you can see sort of the performance of each of your database instances. And in this case, we can see SQL test zero, one, and two. These are each of the database instances, and we can sort of pivot back and forth between each of these database instances and see what's going on. All right? Yeah. So this is all built in. This is kind of one of those examples of built-in management service that comes as part of Arc Enabled Data Services. Okay, so now um, over here, I'm gonna run this command, which is going to execute this transaction. And this transaction is, uh, this is connecting to the database instance at the IP address that is over the read write connection, right? And it's connecting using this username and password and it's executing the, the T-SQL that's contained in this transact SQL uh, file here. So what it does is it just looks for a table to exist. If it exists, then it drops it. Uh, if it, um, and, then, and then it creates the table. And then it does a bunch of data inserts in there and kind of does some calculations to basically put some load on the system. And now that we've kicked this off, you can see that there's a spike in the transactions per second happening up here. Right? Yeah, nice. Okay, and so every, uh, you know, this will just keep running, right? So this takes a few seconds to run each time, plus there's a one second wait built into here. And this will just keep running over and over again just to simulate some load on the system. And in this yep. case, it's read write load, right? It's not just read only load. Now over here, what I'm gonna do is keep an eye on this environment. And you can see here SQL test zero, one, and two. They're all running currently. And this will just keep refreshing every five seconds. 
And over here, we're going to run another command, which is every couple of seconds is going to run a query and it's going to tell us which database instance it's connected to. Right now, it's connected to SQL test zero. Okay, and right up here, we're, we're monitoring SQL test zero and the transactions per second that's happening there. All right, so now going back to our notebook here, um, I want to show you how this kind of works. Actually, let's do this. I'm going to delete this pod and explain to you a couple things while that's happening. So we're going to delete SQL test zero. That's the current primary that we can see here, right? So we're going to delete that. Yep. Oh, no, right? <laughs> there goes our cow. Oh, no. uh, so, um, you can see up here like this um, in a second here, this transactions per second will drop off. You see the connection drop, right? Because that database instance that's the current primary is not available currently. Over here, this uh, connection and query is not working either. Over here, you can see a SQL test zero is back to a 3-4 state, and it's 24 seconds, right? So this is now in the process of redeploying that pod. The agent pods that are inside of here, these three, those have already come up and they're good, right? So now we're just waiting yeah. on the SQL container inside of this pod to also be available. And currently, that takes a couple minutes. So I'm just going to explain a couple things about how this all works while that happens. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll improve this over time. We just finished this. So this is hot off the press. We haven't even released this yet. So this is sort yeah. of a really preview of things. But um, let me explain kind of how this works. So in Kubernetes, there's this concept called a config map. And a config map is you can kind of think of it as like a, a mini database almost for storing configuration in a way that's accessible by uh, services and, and pods and things like that that are running inside of Kubernetes. So it's kind of a way to share state, if you will. And this is backed up by an etcd database, typically in Kubernetes for high availability. So in our case, we've got this config map here. Um, each of the uh, instances has its own config map that stores the configuration about that instance. And then we've got this contained availability group role map here. And this is the one that's sort of the magic. Let me show you what this one looks like. So inside of this config map here, this is this is the key. We have this primary replica right here, and it says SQL test zero. So as of right now, the SQL instances are sort of coordinating amongst themselves, talking to each other like, hey, are you available? Are you available? And currently, you know, before we started this whole thing, SQL test zero was sort of nominated as being the leader, this replica. And so all read-write traffic was being routed to that uh, instance. And you can see over here that the least duration is 30 seconds. What this means is that because we don't want to, like, as soon as we detect a, a lack of availability on the primary, we don't want to necessarily want to immediately fail over, like, every, like, within a second of us seeing that, because that'll just sometimes create so much failover activity just because there's a little blip on the network. We don't want to do something like that. So that's where the least duration comes in. Basically, what this says is, hey, if if the primary is not available for 30 seconds then we're going to fail over. So basically, okay. like, this guy gets a lease on being the primary for 30 seconds. But if he doesn't sort of reestablish himself as the primary within that 30 seconds by sort of heart beating, then the other instances are going to sort of take over and say, OK, you're no longer the primary. We're going to vote amongst ourselves and decide who's going to be the new primary and promote that one to the primary. Yeah. And we'll see that happen here in a few minutes. So this, or in a couple seconds more, probably. So this is kind of how things are orchestrated. Very simple, if you think about it, right? It's just this little config map that keeps track of this information here. And uh, this is also how, you know, in the future, we'll be able to enable manual failover. So if somebody wants to come in and sort of trigger a manual failover to happen, they can do that. So you can see now that the, the queries have come back online, right? So up here, we can see that we have our activity showing up on the chart here. We've got these queries are being successful again here. And over here, we can see that SQL test 2 is now the database instance that we're connecting to. So this was automatically rerouted. This was automatically rerouted. We can see that SQL test 2 is now at 4.4. Everything's running fine. And so this is how we can truly do COWS, right? Because it, it meets all the criteria, right? We don't care about any one database instance. We can scale out and add additional cow DBs that do the same thing, right? And 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 get that scale out performance for read connections as well. So hopefully this is a good, a good tour of what's coming with always on availability groups and Arc enabled data services, and kind of helps people see a new way of, of operating your databases. Yeah, no, definitely it's super interesting. Especially I like the like the cow thing. How how you use that to explain this? So for me, the the not the the wannabe cow thing is basically like you have one cow and you just like if that cow dies or something, you just get a new cow. Um, yeah. 
which looks exactly the same and does exactly the same. But obviously, that takes a little bit of time. And here you basically say, okay, I have three cows. Um, if which the advantage is they also produce more milk. <laughs> um, and, and, but if one dies, it basically just like you still have two other ones, right? And then at the I, I would still replace the one, but the time where I need to, to replace this, I would already have the two cows would still produce milk and still work. And so now it really works really well, like to explain this that way. So I'm like, I, I, I love how these things are working. And as you said, it's it kind of like it also reminds me a little bit. Like I know I shouldn't probably say that, but kind of like I we have some things in like Windows failover cluster where like, it, it kind of like also like uh, it, it solved the same challenges in a way, right? It like addressed a little bit like of the same challenges we had there uh, to make sure that like if one node fails in a cluster, we fail it over. And then I remember I think we also had a value where we said, hey. How fast should we decide to fail it over? Maybe again, there's just a flickering network, as you said, or maybe just like, something didn't answer, like these 30 seconds you mentioned there. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, no, pretty cool yeah. stuff. It's actually very similar to Windows Server cluster services. It's just a different way of doing it in you know using Kubernetes. And and the thing about that is that it's just consistent everywhere. You can deploy it on any infrastructure. You know, going back to this kind of our our beginning here, that this is really about embracing hybrid and like bringing Azure to you and yeah, this is how we do things in Azure, and yeah. now you're going to be able to do it the same way in your own environment. And and what I also love, I mean, as you said, it's an Azure service, and it already has a lot of stuff built in which I don't need to take care of, right? As you yeah. said, like availability groups and all that stuff. Availability, like that was like I remember setting that up for a bunch of like, for example, system center clusters and stuff like that in the past. Yeah, um, and. I, I, I needed to do that to get the availability, but actually I, I didn't want to do it because it was just, as you said, it was a little bit of pain. So it's some extra work. I don't want to, like if I, I, I just can get it by just setting a command, like you showed uh, the VC switch uh, or um, the tier, like to uh, business critical, yep. that would have been, that is obviously way easier than, than just like setting up the whole thing. Uh, and then also like the monitoring tools, like the Grafana, uh, the, the Influx DB built in and the Grafana dashboard. Yep. Yep. I also like that very much that I don't have to yep. like set up a monitoring solution. Uh, for <laughs> the thing. Former system center guys, we can really appreciate that, right? It's, it's just there. You don't have to go set it up and everything, right? And, yeah. and it works everywhere in the same way. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a new way of doing things. No, that, that's pretty cool. I really, really love the thing. And I also appreciate very much, by the way, and again, I want to highlight this again. This is a super early version you just showed us yeah. um, we're, with something like, again, not something we, we you could try, like the, the, the BC tier is not something you can try out, right? Um, uh, it's like something really, really new. And I appreciate always when people show me such awesome new stuff and technology. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So. I now obviously have a lot of like um, time after I recorded all these videos. <laughs> I definitely want to go out and and try these things. So I I yeah. heard that Azure Arc enabled data services is in public preview. Is that that That's so I can go and try it out, right? Yeah, exactly. So so the wannabe cow pattern we saw today, you can go try that out right now. The the full cow pattern that'll be available very soon. Where I'm hoping by the end of February we'll have that out into the public preview uh, release. So that's coming. But yeah, go try out everything else that's available right now with both the Azure SQL Managed Instance as well as Postgres SQL Hyperscale. Awesome. And so if I want to learn more about this, um, like if like I want to go now out because I like really want to learn more. Do you have a couple of resources to share with us? I've got a couple you can see on the screen here. There, there's, there's a lot, right? So, you know, Azure Arc is, is a really big thing, you know, across all of the different Azure teams, right? And so there's a lot to go learn here. So lots of links here, you know, feel free to dive in, um, especially on the right column here. I'll just make a plug for data services because that's, that's my thing. But, you know, definitely go try that out and, you know, feel free to reach out to me as well. You know, just shoot me an email, hit me up on Twitter. Always happy to have a chat with folks and get some feedback on how things are going or help people. Awesome. Thank you very much, Travis. It was a pleasure to have you uh, on this call. Uh, I learned a lot. I always like like these sessions because I, I get a lot of information on this. Uh, I hope all our viewers also learned a lot. Um, and if you want to learn more about Azure Arc, about other hybrid technologies we have in Microsoft, 
We have some great sessions on Azure Stack uh, HCI, on AKS on Azure Stack HCI. If you want to look, dive into more of the Kubernetes side of things. Um, we also have some great session on Azure Arc enabled servers. So how you can actually manage your service in a hybrid environment. And I hope again, this session was really, really helpful. Uh, we showed you, Travis showed you a couple of different things like how you actually can take the Azure SQL service and bring it to basically every platform. Doesn't matter if you run that on premise in your data on premises in your data center at your like uh, branch office or at your retail store or even at the other cloud provider. So um, that is really, really great. And then obviously how actually the management and the whole the plumbing behind it works and how we get all that resiliency. Now, thank you very much again, Travis. If you want to watch more of these sessions, um, go to aka.ms slash IT ops talks. That's where you find more of these sessions and more of the videos uh, we have prepared for you. Thank you very much. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Thomas.